Come on. Hey, everybody. It's Lisa Carlin. I'm your host for Hey Doc, What's New in Plant-Based Medicine? And I'm here. I'm so happy to have again my favorite cardiologist, Dr. Joel Kahn. Hey, Dr. Kahn, how are you doing today? I'm good from the great state of Michigan, a pretty sunny, pretty day, and excited to be back to What's up? Hey, Doc. Some Doc. We can uh, put it. Hey, Doc. <laughs> yeah, we can improvise here. So tell me, what's new in plant-based medicine? Ooh, it's busy all the time. And sometimes it's new data. This week we had more online warfare. Everybody, you know, strap on your your uh, criticism proof vest because there was a whole lot of it going on. In fact, I just got off Twitter five seconds ago being beat up, but that's okay because we only talk about the best science and the most reliable. So um, probably the biggest news, uh, you know, in the last week, I think we should start with American Cancer Society, how to lower your risk of cancer. I think it's eating more beef, chicken, bacon, and butter, right? I don't think so. I don't think so either, but let's see what the American Cancer Society says. Well, I'm very happy of what they're talking about. Here is a sample of their new guidelines. Whoa. Oh, this is radical. This stuff is hashtag fake news. Of course not. Let's, let's read them through. How's that? Let's go for it. And you can see this is brand new news. I think you took this from it looks like Good Morning America. They didn't have the wisdom to call me or you and do the interview with them, but maybe <laughs> next week. Uh, and you can see the little symbol, American Cancer Society. And, you know, maybe even before we go and read it through, although everybody is reading it through, which is great. Um, you know, the, there are there's the American Heart Association. There's the American College of Cardiology. There's American Society, Cancer Society. There's American Diabetes Association. You know, we cut the body up into all kinds of different parts. And what I love about these guidelines, if you actually maybe took a mannequin of the body and taped the guideline for that organ or that group, they're all the same with various nuances. Maybe I'll talk about that in a minute. And I love the fact that, you know, I've trained in what's called functional medicine, integrative medicine, after I did standard cardiology. So, you know, you gotta go see the lung doctor, you gotta go see the, uh, the dermatologist, you gotta go see the GI doctor, the cardiologist. Functional medicine teaches for most conditions there's something systemic that ties them all together. We're all a network, we're all a web. And when you look at this is the, you know, the seven blind people touching the elephant, describing it differently, but it's an elephant. You know, this is the cancer group approaching the data to say, how do you reduce your risk of cancer? This uh, is big. Lifestyle. But, you know, if we went over to the diabetes, we went over to the heart, went over to the uh, asthma prevention. And this week also, we uh, probably just, mention that towards the end, Alzheimer's Awareness Month and a new guideline statement. It is it is literally seven people touching the same thing. And uh, I find that very, actually very supportive and very confirmatory. So Lisa, Carlin, could you pull back up that amazing graphic you made? You did. There we go. What does it say? Well, we have the New American Cancer Society guidelines. They are asking for more physical activity. And what I thought was really interesting is they're asking for um, between 150 and 300 uh, minutes per week of moderate intensity activity or 75 to 100 minutes per week of vigorous right. um, intensity activity. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, bing, and those might be my computer, your computer. It's certainly waking everybody up. I think it's great. Um, yeah, those are straight out of re actually the American Heart Association guidelines, and I think they uh, have wisely adopted them, given that the focus of cardiologists on exercise is probably a little bit more keen and uh, nuanced. Um, and I have right in my medical office, right, uh, 10 feet to my right where I see patients, 22 minutes a day moderate or vigorous exercise. Why do I have 22 minutes a day? Because 22 times seven is about 150 minutes a week of moderate or <clears throat> vigorous exercise. You can vigorous, vigorous exercise would be 10 minutes a day. Yeah, well, you know, 10 minutes a day, like high intensity interval training where you can barely talk, Yeah. moderate or somewhat vigorous where you can maintain a conversation, but you're breathless, mm -hmm. it's a bit interrupted. Those are some of the ways to judge it. Some people use this scale perceived exertion scale you could monitor your heart rate and you know make sure you're in the 
upper end of your heart rate range. These are all ways to say, is it moderate? Is it? Uh, it's like the difference between a slow yoga class and a vigorous vinyasa yoga class. You know that. Dr. Dr. Khan, what do you do for your model uh, intensity? Do you have several different things you do depending on where you are? Yeah, and I like the 22 minute a day because there's certain days that's all I can fit in in the morning and I feel good I'm hitting my guideline. Although, of course, you could double it if you want to go for 300 minutes a week. But yeah, there may be a stationary bike, there may be an elliptical, there may be a treadmill. Summertime, I'm outside. I have a weighted vest and anybody who has a decent uh, back and shoulder health, if you want to get a 20, 25 pound weighted vest, it's not only adds to your cardio workout, your heart rate will be higher. So I walking up and down hills with a 25 pound weighted vest. It's supposed to be very good for osteoporosis prevention. Just that extra weight while you're walking. Of course, if you can't do it, can't do it there. You want to spend a little bit more, you can get these vests where you can vary the amount of weight so you can tailor it. Maybe you share it with somebody who wants more weight and you want less or vice versa. Uh, I do that. I do um, a lot of weights. Uh, and, you know, if you do weights vigorously, some kind of circuit with weights, you can get your heart rate up and qualify as moderate or vigorous. Uh, so, yeah, I, I'm bored, but I vary it so I don't get bored. You know, so okay. you know, that weighted vest, what I was going to say about the weighted vest is I have a little story about that I'd like to tell is right. I went on a cruise, the the um, uh, the. The, the vegan cruise, yeah. holistic, holistic holiday at sea. And Dr. Michael Clapper was on the cruise. And my cousin, who's about 10 years older than I am, is very fit, has been a runner her whole life, was diagnosed with um, osteoporosis. So I asked, and she was shocked because she's thin and she eats healthy and she runs. So I asked Dr. Clapper, what do we do? And he suggested a weighted vest. So she got one. She used it for two years and then she went and had another DEXA scan. And wouldn't you know it, she laid down new bone. She went from osteoporosis to, you don't have osteoporosis. It worked really well. And and she's little, so she's about um, five feet tall. So she you know couldn't take a big vest, but she had the little bit, the little weights that she put on and wow. could vary it. And then she'd have to wear a windbreaker over it. Otherwise it made her look like she was a suicide bomber. Yeah, you know, it is it is makes you bulky. Um, what I actually do, just because I'm crazy, is in quarantine, I bought, you know, COVID quarantine, I bought two things. And that was my only online shopping. One was a weighted vest. I also bought an inversion table. And honestly, after about 20 minutes, 25 minutes of walking with a weighted vest, I go pop on five minutes and I feel like I got my hike back. I'm back to five foot ten. I'm down to five foot seven after the weighted vest. And so I, all kinds of fun. You know, you got to have fun with fitness or you're going to get bored with it. And uh, we yeah. don't have the joy of group classes very often, although there are group outside classes. Okay. Uh, let's talk about number two. Food? Diet rich in fruits, veggies, and grains. I wonder why they left out legumes. Um, it's so controversial. Um, you know, it's not controversial. It's a good question. Why didn't they include the word legumes? I'd have to go back. You know, the actual paper is about 70 pages long. And perhaps uh, as it was transitioned to GMA uh, slides, they left off legumes. But yeah. uh, certainly legumes. Is there data that peas, beans, and lentils? Uh, you know, it happens to be Congratulations, everybody. It's World Microbiome Day. It's There's actually a day to celebrate healthy poop. And today is Healthy Poop Day. So <laughs> is there data, it's a true story, is there data that peas, beans, and lentils contribute to a healthy microbiome uh -huh. where you lower your risk of cancer by fiber and feeding your bacteria, uh, not sugar, not alcohol, not <laughs> fat. Uh, today's the day to celebrate. So they should have added legumes, I agree. Uh, I'm not sure. And then, of course, societal changes. I mean, one of the biggest triggers of cancer is air pollution, water impurities, uh, lack of access to healthy food, lack of access to places to exercise. And these are important parts of making it more widely available, making cancer prevention not something elite, making it, you know, uh, universal for all. So you have to build in, you have to address yeah. You know, food deserts and, uh, you know, farmers markets and garden, you know, just gardening societies and such to allow everybody to have access. And um, and then they also said it's not on the slide. They talked about um, either eliminating or eating much less processed meats, which we know cause cancer, colorectal cancer and red meat. 
Right. That's, uh, again, one of those pieces of the body network. We can talk about the brain, the heart, prostate disease, breast disease. In this case, we're talking about cancer in general. But the strongest data and probably the most offending food on the list is the bacon, sausage, pepperoni, hot dog, corned beef family of toxins. And, you know, uh, two strips of bacon a day which is not much for bacon eaters, uh, increases your risk of colorectal cancer by 18%. And some people laugh and say 18% is not that much. It's also about the same risk as secondhand smoke, increases your risk of lung cancer. So uh, that is generally recognized as a habit to avoid secondhand smoke for a mm -hmm. child or a spouse or family member. So uh, bacon is nothing but secondhand pig, obviously. And yeah. you, want to, you want to avoid it for sure. Processed meats are the lowest rung of food. And also processed foods is on their list. Right. Not processed meats, but just overly processed foods and refined grains, which of course lack fiber. Exactly. Or it's been pulverized so little that uh, it's uh, no longer really functioning to move uh, your colon transit time and feed your microbiome. And then we've got that controversial one. Uh, which GMA goosed a little bit. The language of the American Cancer Society was limit, moderate, or abstinence. There were yeah. all three. It's obviously, there's no data that you lower your cancer risk with alcohol, but yeah. can you make a, uh, what's the term everybody uses? You know, moderation and everything except right. moderation. Uh, you know, what's moderation? The current health guidelines in the United States call for a maximum of one to two drinks a day for a guy, one drink a day for a woman, yeah. based on differences in metabolizing alcohol on average. Uh, it doesn't really work all that accurately. Yeah. But the growing data on breast cancer and some other specific malignancies and alcohol, uh, as well as certainly certain cardiac conditions, not all, but like atrial fibrillation, do call for you know real wisdom in choosing how many days a week and what you drink and how often you drink or don't drink at all. So I think this is really not a license to say women can have one drink a day and men can have two. It's that if you are going to drink on a very special occasion, don't don't exceed those limits. And right. it's just it's kind of like saying smoking. Well, smoking's bad, but should I have two cigarettes a week? Is that really bad for me? Yeah, it probably is bad. And I'm not suggesting we should smoke, but I, I oh, think okay. the whole lot better than is, day, right? in this situation, I think is good, is great. Right. So, um, all right, let's move on to the next one. We talked a little bit about this before. This was the guideline recommendations about how much, we talked about how much exercise. Let's talk about what we eat in the middle there. Right, uh, you know, and I love the word variety. They're back to vegetables, fruits, and whole grains. They kind of left our favorite uh, food group in addition, legumes off, but we can reinstate legumes. And then, and I love the word variety because again, we're learning on World Microbiome Day that, you know, there's more than one kind of pepper. There's green peppers, red peppers, yellow peppers, hot peppers, and you know, you, variety helps create uh, health and wealth in your microbiome, which is strongly related to your risk of cancer or not. There are many different grains, there's many different fruits. You want all those rainbow colors. And literally, yeah. white cauliflower, purple eggplants, green leafies, um, red bell peppers, and yellow. What's yellow? Why don't we pick uh, squash. Yeah. a what? Squash. A yellow squash is good. And then probably should include our beta carotene rich orange foods like cantaloupe and orange peppers and, uh, and, and yellow peppers. So pepper, yellow and orange peppers. And then we got limit or avoid red or processed meats. We talked and we should say that over and over. Sugar sweetened beverages and cancer. There you go. And it took us a while. We certainly do agree in the cardiology community that it's not a zero versus a hundred pounds a year, but limiting sugar sweetened, sh limiting sugar, I would say avoid all sugar sweetened beverages, but limit sugar is part of cardiovascular recommendations. And it uh, is associated, it might be indirect. I don't think anybody has actually shown that sugar itself triggers cancer growth, um, but sugar promotes obesity because of the mass volume of sugar rich foods we're eating. And obesity is linked to cancer because of inflammation and uh, high estrogen states and other specific factors. Let's go back to that pretty picture. There was something uh, beyond sugar sweetened beverages. Oh, there was alcohol. There was alcohol, but then, you know, highly processed foods like you 
point out, and refined grain products. You know, we have to give the bagel a big no. I mean, if you can find a whole grain bagel, or if you take a whole grain bagel, put lettuce, tomato, avocado, you've turned it into a better than average bagel. But, you know, more so for sure, donuts, which donuts are perfect. They're more sugar than you need. They're refined flour and they're fried. And uh, they're perfect that. to create cancer. They really are the perfect bomb, but they're also the perfect bomb for your brain and your heart and uh, any other organ system you might want to pick. So, yeah, refined grains. That's why people argue online, you know, carbs are ego, evil. Well, are you talking a donut or yeah. are you talking, you know, a bowl of black beans with some spice on it? I mean, you have to be very specific. Potatoes with salsa. Yeah, absolutely. Potatoes have a surprisingly large amount of fiber. It happens to be Andrew Taylor's birthday today, Spud Fit. If you don't know who Spud Fit is, go find him on social media. He lost over 100 pounds eating only potatoes for Okay, year. that's right. In Australia. He's got a great cookbook. I contributed a baked potato recipe to his cookbook. So I love that. You can tag, tag him at Spud Fit or Andrew Taylor. Happy birthday. I think he turned 40 today, but he turned potatoes into sexy. And I think what the American Cancer Society is doing is they're they're really helping to introduce the idea of of antioxidants. And when people eat a colorful plant-based diet, it necessarily is rich in antioxidants. And those are cancer fighting. But you don't think French fries and ketchup are rich in antioxidants? I don't. I don't either. They're rich in, you know, carcinogens, but not antioxidants. Yes. So we really want to try to keep our plate colorful and look like a rainbow. Okay, so now the other thing, I think we covered cancer. So the guidelines are pretty plant friendly, I think we can say. And kudos to the American Cancer Society for coming up with some decent guidelines. It's a great first step. Right, you know, and it's even a breakthrough that they're talking about nutrition and cancer because, you know, you didn't sit in medical school 30 years ago or 20 or 10 and hear about preventing cancer with nutrition. So this may seem, well, of course, that's obvious, but just to get more and more major and well-funded medical societies yeah. that might prompt food guidelines and education for nurses and doctors and dentists and the whole gamut, dietitians, is a uh, helpful. I'll throw in one more little cancer piece, and that's news of this week. Some of the listeners know of one of my favorite nutrition researchers, Dr. Walter Longo. Dr. Longo is at the University of Southern California in Lisa Carlin's hometown of Los Angeles, and he is perhaps the most funded and the most esteemed nutrition scientist in the world. If not, he's certainly in the top few. And he developed a plant-based fasting program called Prolon or the Fasting Mimicking Diet. I will make you chuckle. I have my laptop propped up with four of his books because he gave me just the right height for my camera, The Longevity Diet. Must read and you aren't gonna see any bacon or sausage on the cover of his book. He's not noted to be a vegan researcher, but if you read his book, you'll say, man, he's talking about plant-based nutrition. His research group and a research group in Leiden, which I believe is in the Netherlands, just published this week, if you are a woman who unfortunately has breast cancer in the process of getting your chemotherapy and you use Dr. Longo's plant-based fasting food program called Prolon, you actually have fewer side effects and a better outcome. You actually change the course based on x-ray and pathology of your breast cancer. So we actually have a specific example, not just a preventing American Cancer Society guidelines uh, cancer, but actually now using nutrition as a tool. And this is just a huge breakthrough, even though it's a very specific food group and a very specific group of patients. So I'm excited. That's great. Okay, let's move on to the next topic. And that is the 10 year or more controversy about the role of saturated fat. Is it okay? Can you have some of it? Does it contribute to heart disease? There have been some pretty passionate um, debates I've listened to on Joe Rogan that you were part of uh, for four hours, that four hour marathon. Um, there have been some interesting Twitter um, discussions with Nina Teicholz, who is an author, not a healthcare provider. And now we've got some pretty definitive information about saturated fat. Can you tell us, this is an article that's in the beat and your title is the big fat war is over saturated fat causes heart disease. 
by Dr. Joel Kahn. So let's just talk a little bit about this because I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, I'll break this down quick, but it's a topic I'm pretty both familiar with and passionate about. You know, after World War II, there was a big rise in heart attacks in the United States. Minneapolis was one of the key. And it caused health professionals to be concerned. Why is this happening? And some things were obvious. Soldiers came back from Europe and Pacific with free cigarettes and the smoking habit was much more common after World War II than previously. And we saw for the first time fast food and drive-ins and drive-throughs and soon after McDonald's, the diet was changing quickly. Mom wasn't cooking homemade meals anymore. Heart attacks went crazy. So a lot of research went into why. And we did learn smoking, diabetes, high blood pressure. But we learned that diet was a factor. And at first, the conversation, and I'm talking actually way back in the 1950s, was that all dietary fat could be linked to heart disease. It was broken down and refined. And the data was more specifically that saturated fat, a specific length and type of molecule, a palmitic acid, if you want to know uh, one of the names, stearic acid, uh, but those are the biochemical names, was most related to developing heart disease and driving your cholesterol up. And where do you find that? Butter, beef, cheese, pastries made with lard, a ghee, and actually coconut oil is the plant-based food that's very rich in saturated fat. There's a name associated with this research, Dr. Ansel Keys, PhD. Uh, he lived to over age 100, so his diet worked pretty well for him. Uh, there's the Mediterranean diet, which he brought back from Italy as an example of a lower saturated fat diet. And wow, we're actually showing some data. So this is, I'm very familiar with this. I've had the pleasure of writing a long, research paper on the research of Dr. Ansel Keys along with David Katz, MD, many people know. So this is called the Six Study Country. This was Dr. Keys asking a question from a database. This was a hypothesis. If we track how much fat is in the diet and if we pick countries that have a variety of fat intake from the United States being the king of fat, this is from a database from, if I remember, 1951, and Japan being the lowest fat intake. And you look at your risk of dying of heart disease, the higher the fat intake, the higher the uh, risk of heart disease deaths. Uh, it turns out he went on to refine his theory and then test it and would substitute, if you look here, it talks percentage of calories from fat, but um, he substituted saturated fat in the rest of his research. And if you look at that, and Japan is about 10% of calories from fat. Well, that's about what Dr. Esselstyn, Dr. Bernard, Dr. Ornish uh, diets typically have. And the United States was all the way up to a very fatty 40%. And most of it was greasy processed food. So he went on to do something called the seven country study, did other metabolic studies. By 1970, the American Heart Association said, public, you want to have less heart disease, lower the amount of saturated fat in your diet. And I think the current guidelines are less than 7% of calories should be saturated fat, but as low as possible. You got to give up butter and cheese and meats and poultry and pork and fish uh, because it's almost exclusively animal foods. Pastries made with butter and lard like a croissant would be on the list, a very common way to get saturated fat in the diet. And this all went unchallenged, along with a drop in heart disease in the United States and other countries like Finland, until 10 years ago, just like you mentioned, Lisa, when a group of researchers published a paper that questioned, it was a, called a meta-analysis. We couldn't confirm higher saturated fat, higher heart disease. Uh, the senior author, Ronald Krauss, is funded by the dairy industry. The paper had many, many flaws. Uh, uh, a noted uh, nutritionist named Jeremiah Stamler, MD, who also just celebrated his 100th birthday, he's doing things pretty well, uh, criticized the heck out of the paper the minute it was published. But the news was out. You know the media, clickbait, even 10 years ago. They, oh, uh, saturated fat is good for you. It's not bad for you. Eat more saturated fat. That's not what the researchers said, but they did open a can of worms and they had funding conflicts. And then uh, 2014, a second paper with similar conflicts came out. And then we got this in 2014. The, you know, the researchers never said eat butter. The researchers questioned the relationship of Time magazines trying to sell magazines, you know, eat butter. It's the same year that 
you mentioned Nina Teichel's and a book called The Big Fat Surprise came out and the public was confused. Maybe I should add butter back. I've been avoiding it. Maybe I should put more meat in my diet. Maybe I should put more cheese and croissants in my diet. Because frankly, we had people on the news all the time. It didn't help when my friend Mark Hyman, MD, wrote a book called Eat Fat, Get Thin. And my patients would, you know, they'd email me. Hey, last night, good looking doctor, talks well, seems real smart. I think I'm going to add some butter back in my diet because Dr. Hyman told me I can eat fat and get thin. And we can really question. He got into a real uh, uh, fight with Dr. Dean Ornish about twisting some of Dr. Ornish's data that I'm not sure. I think that is public, actually. Dr. Hyman actually slightly apologized for all that. I know some of the backstory. So here we go. And let's show why did I write this article in the beat that the big fat war is over? Because I think you have a nice slide there. Uh, maybe one more. Yeah, I love this. Lisa, good for you. You found this slide. I've actually never seen this slide. And this is really pretty technical, but it gets to quality. You know, in everything we do, uh, quality of food, quality of air, quality of the gasoline you put in your car, whatever. Quality, quality, quality. So this is somebody's creation, but I love it, that there are ways to get nutrition and science data that are considered very high quality. And then there are others that may be valuable, but they're uh, not as completely reliable. But I just want to point out at the top of the pyramid, the most reliable analysis you're going to see in the science world is generally considered to be something out of Ireland called the Cochrane Library or the Cochrane Database. And they'll take any topic, vaccines for children uh, or uh, soy milk for infants, or um, I, I can't imagine now how many hundreds and hundreds, if not more than that, of topics have been analyzed. They'll break down all the research out there. They'll throw the low quality, objectionable research out, not with a bias, but based on it just being poor quality. They'll leave in the studies that have the most data and the most transparency and the least conflicts. And they'll analyze them. It's usually called a systematic review and meta-analysis. And they'll publish it. And anybody can look them up. They have their own website. They're on the National Library of Medicine. But it's not that they aren't capable of making mistakes, but they're just felt to be more reliable than reading, you know, the National Enquirer. <laughs> and just recently, they, uh, Dr. Hooper was the first author. They put together the 16 most reliable studies they could find. They use a really tough criteria. It's called the GRADE, G-R-A-D-E criteria for analyzing if a study is of high quality or low quality. And I think it was 55,000 subjects were in this study. All the studies asked the question, is there a relationship between saturated fat and heart disease? And when the Cochrane database uh, paper was published, a very long paper with a lot of statistics, but their conclusion was, and it made headlines, that on average, dropping the saturated fat in your diet, drum roll, please, Dr. Ansel Keys and his family, listen, lowered your risk of heart disease by 21%. 21% less risk of heart attack, stroke, dying suddenly, congestive heart failure. Pretty substantial number. If right now, every hospital, one-fifth of the heart patients could leave, one-fifth of the bypass patients could check out, one-fifth of the stent patients, uh, you know, you would impact American medicine positively in every regard. People would feel better and there'd be far less costs and far less complications uh, and all the rest. So um, major, major announcement. Now, what puzzled me, I discovered this just searching the National Library of Medicine. I will do that time to time. I might put in cardiovascular re reversal, cardiovascular prevention, uh, any topic in the world. Um, and I saw it just recently. I said, whoa, where's CNN, where's Fox, where's, you know, uh, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and on and on. I couldn't find any media outlet that had written anything on this. So I'm not so good at it, but due to the good graces of people like Lisa Carlin, Jane Velez Mitchell, I rung up my friend Klaus uh, Mitchell, uh, Jane Velez Mitchell, same last name, and made a little, you know, quick video about it. I wrote an article for Live Kindly and 
some of the other play. I wanted to create a little buzz about this as much as I can do. And I will post those articles in the comment section on Facebook and YouTube so people can click on them, read right. them, comment on them, and please share because that's how this information gets out. It is legitimate scientific data and it's being kept from the masses. Probably because when you look at mainstream media, you always have to consider the advertisers. And if something is going to make the advertisers frustrated and ticked off, they're going to say, we're going to cut off your funding for your show next year. Sorry. So the shows we get are basically what the advertisers approve of. And we see that. I agree. Time. It's getting hot and controversial here on Hey Doc. But it's also, unfortunately, the honest truth that uh, you know, follow the trail of money very often reveals a lot. So uh, to this date, I mean, it's it could have been a really big splash. And forget about the media. It's something the public needs to hear. I mean, now 70 years of scientific research based on trying to address a very serious problem, heart attacks, strokes, people dying. Um, and here we have a you know, a high quality review that basically was just ignored. And it's important. So if you're choosing not to eat butter, cheese, red meats, poultry, fish, pork, and maybe you're uh, avoiding coconut oil and palm oil because of their exceptionally high content of saturated fat, you can feel good that, you know, you're in, you're totally in tune with seven decades of science in total I'm sure thousands of research papers. And it's very hard to get every paper to say the same thing because of just difficulties in nutrition science. There's a lot, I mean, we know what happens. And maybe I should say this. The theory is, because I've been challenged on Twitter, so what does saturated fat do? Uh, there are animal studies that saturated fat on your liver um, are receptors, little locking keys, but this would be the keyhole receptors to take LDL cholesterol out of the blood into the liver to break it down, reuse it, make, uh, make it into vitamin D and other things you might need, testosterone, estrogen, that a high saturated fat diet decreases the amount or density of LDL cholesterol receptors. So if there aren't any of those keyholes and cholesterol is the key, it's got no place on the liver or less places on the liver to be taken up. So your blood cholesterol level goes up. And the data, there's actually something called the Keys formula, another one called the Hegestead formula, but it's out of you know dozens and dozens of carefully done nutrition studies. Here's the amount of saturated fat in the diet. Here's the blood cholesterol that we anticipate you're gonna have. And it's a very strong relationship because this is known and you might say, I thought cholesterol in the blood was good. Yes, everybody needs cholesterol to make vitamin D and testosterone and cortisol. You don't and, and also also components of uh, cholesterol is made is part of the components of cell membranes. Absolutely. So uh, you know there is no diet, there is no medicine, there is no operation that drops your cholesterol to zero or anything even close to zero. But you know uh, there is very commonly in medicine it's called the sweet spot or the J curve. But you know too little could be a problem. We don't really have any data. There's such a disease, but it could. We do have ample data that high cholesterol levels, they raise your risk. You know, there's always going to be a 103-year-old woman who had a high cholesterol, smoked and ate bacon, and is celebrating her birthday in the newspaper. But, you know, would you base your life on the fact that you can reproduce her track record? You wouldn't. It's like, it's like winning the lottery. Right. So and, all the policies, I like to tell my clients when I teach that all the policies are basically under the bell-shaped curve. Right. So, you know, one standard deviation, which is the distance from the peak of that curve. So when you get get further, when you get further and further away, then you're further and further away from what's normal. So there always are going to be people in each extreme on each side of that curve. But you don't make policies for the public based on the, a huge distance called multiple two or three standard deviations away from the curve. That's the bottom line. So we have to try to make policies for the majority of people. So that woman who smokes and drank and ate bacon and saturated fat every day for 120, 105 years is the anomaly. She's the one three standard deviations away from the curve. I agree. And, you know, but the exciting news for the listeners is, did my article end the saturated fat debate, Lisa? 
Yeah. Well, You're, it should have, but did it in the news? It didn't get the media attention that it should have, uh, unfortunately. It didn't get the media attention, absolutely. And I didn't expect the New York Times to write an article because I wrote an article. Uh, it would have been a good thing. I do know some of the reporters. And actually, when I send them stuff like this, it's just not on their agenda. It's yeah. not consistent. If you think that the news doesn't have biases and forget politics and forget you know, uh, national policies on just food, there are ketogenic reporters that won't write about plant-based diets. Okay. And I can tell you uh, whether it's that they enjoy animal diets, whether their friends take them out for dinner with animal diets. I'm not making accusations, but I absolutely know firsthand it's it's true. Um, you know, we have our own plant-based media of which Jane and Jane is an excellent part of it. Uh, and sometimes it's the only way we can get some of this stuff out credibly while we just, you know, well, Tina Tuckles can write an editorial about how saturated fat is good for your heart. She's not a doctor. She's not a PhD. She doesn't have a lab. It'll get published in the LA Times. She's done that a dozen times. because Shocking. Shocking. And I cannot get an article published in the LA Times, but uh, that's a problem. Um, but what I want to say right now, we're doing something on Jane Unchained that I'd like to tell everybody about. We just yeah. started our second season of New Day, New Chef, and this is called Support and Feed Edition. And we've partnered with Maggie Baird, who is Billie Eilish and Phineas's mother. And we're doing a program where we're getting donations and we use those donations to go to the restaurants because the restaurants are suffering places like Ron Russell at Sun Cafe, uh, for example, is the first episode. So the donations go to pay for food, the restaurants make the food, and then it gets distributed to people in need. All kinds of people in need. It can be first responders, it can be people who simply don't have food. And they're preparing about 150 meals. So oh, please great. go to Amazon Prime, watch the second season of New Day, New Chef, and maybe with the power of Billie Eilish's 19 million followers, the word will get out. I hope so. Quite a force. and. Got a great fashion sense too. Uh, but I just want to circle back. Yeah, we have one more study to talk about. And that's the one published in Medical Daily that was in the American College, the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. So why don't we talk about that? Bring it up. That's where I was heading and you're so organized. So I don't know if we have a beautiful slide or have slide. smoke coming out of your ears. I think you're planning to do this. Yeah, I don't have a slide. I thought you'd talk oh, about it. Okay, no problem. Hey, let's do this without a slide. That's easy. So um, let's talk about, again, media bias, which is why we need Jane Unchained and Hey Doc. So in a very prominent journal, now all digital, of course, called the Journal American College of Cardiology. When we hear American College of Cardiology, we're angels whispering Kim Williams, MD, the past president of the American College of Cardiology and a very famous plant-based physician, actually a famous physician who happens to be plant-based because he's smart. Um, but anyways, there was a paper published about 10 days ago. What did the title say? Saturated fat is not a cause of heart disease. Can you believe it? This is about one week after the Cochrane database review. And we just saw this beautiful pyramid that many people would agree the Cochrane database is the least affected by bias, the highest quality in terms of picking studies, and uh, you know the more trusted uh, consumer report resource for making decisions in your own health. Let's talk about this new study. Number one, it got headlines everywhere. If you go right now and put it in your search engine, and my favorite right now is DuckDuckGo because they don't collect all your data. If you don't know what DuckDuckGo.com, it'll be a great search engine for you to play with. Go put in saturated fat, hit news, You'll see article after article after article that responds to this new journal, American College of Cardiology article that encourages you to feel good about eating meat, cheese, eggs, beef, bacon, and hot dogs. What's the deal with it? Because you can, you know, there's all these studies out there. It depends which studies you include, which studies you exclude, how big they are, what bias there is. Well, let's talk about the 12 authors of this new paper. They weren't Cochrane database reviewers. The 12 authors have to list at the end funding and conflicts. What did eight of the 12 list? They listed, they take money directly from the beef industry, the dairy industry, or both. Eight of the 12. Uh, that wasn't the case with the Cochrane database review. Um, you know, you have to raise your eyebrows 
of which none of these articles you'll find on your search engine are going to talk about the incredibly strong bias that may exist because their research their labs, their lectures and national meetings are paid for by the beef industry and the dairy industry. The most famous of the group is the last author. His name is Ronald Krauss, MD, K-R-A-U-S-S, -S, Krauss, MD. He's a children cholesterol expert in Oakland, California. He's very well known. He's published a lot of papers. And honestly, this guy blows in the wind. He got famous in the plant-based world because Dr. John McDougall has a nickname for Ronald Krauss. He calls him Dr. Lard. If you ever have time, go over to Dr. McDougall and read a few blogs, probably about five, six, eight years ago about Dr. Lard. Because repeatedly, repeatedly, um, Dr. Uh, Krauss would write pro-fat, and not just any fat, pro-animal fat articles that they aren't all that bad for your cholesterol. He's a very esteemed researcher, but his funding is from the dairy industry, at least in part, without a doubt. Uh, wow, we're getting a nice few comments now. Thank you very much. But so Dr. Krauss was known as Dr. Lard. Then about two years ago, he actually wrote a paper where he questioned, he actually wrote something nice about Ansel Keys, and he actually questioned whether saturated fat was good for you. He, in, he was included in a consensus that said coconut oil should probably be avoided. And at the end of the day, I wrote a blog saying he's not Dr. Lard anymore. He's back to an honest assessment of the science. But two years later, he's the senior author with his dairy funding listed there, and he's blown in the wind again. So rather disappointed uh, in his performance as well as the rest. Uh, that's the problem with science. You can twist a lot of it. It's all about, often, not always, politics, money, careers, travel. Uh, don't assume it's all of high integrity. Uh, some of you may know, and I'm off track, but I'll finish. There were two papers published three weeks ago about treating COVID-19 with hydroxychloroquine and other uh, drugs, the antibiotics. And within like a week, it was identified. And these were published in New England Journal of Medicine and Lancet, two of the best and most revered medical journals in the world, if not the top two. It was identified that this was all fraud, that these were fake data. They were quoting fake hospitals that weren't involved in the study. I don't say that to bring that up as a topic we need to go further right now. But be suspicious if everything you've heard year after year after year after year um, suddenly looks to be wrong because of one headline or one Time magazine or one, you know, new guru on PBS. So, uh, you know, always take a breath and say, let's just let this settle a little. Let's see if there's any data on the funding and on who the authors are. And it's hard to track this stuff down, but this was like shooting fish in a barrel. And I don't shoot fish in a barrel because that'd be cruel. But um, you'd have to come up shooting tofu in a barrel. But eight <laughs> of the 12 authors have their funding conflicts there. Now, you know, not, uh, not all people that have funding from an industry necessarily do wicked research. Uh, Dr. David Katz would tell us the fact that he received some money from the egg industry hasn't completely jaded his ability to comment on the health or, uh, or dangers of eating eggs. But, you know, you do need to be aware. And when it's a whole mass group, eight of 12, you might well consider this just to be something to line your parakeet cage with. Hmm. <laughs> I got it. Yeah, that's really important. And, you know, it, we, as we learn, and I like to teach people to, when they look at a journal article, usually in the lower left-hand corner of the front page, it will have all the biases, disclosures, and you can see who funded the research. So um, I, you can make your own decision if you, you know that even at a, at a fine university like UCLA or even Harvard, if something is funded by a large agricultural industry, they're not going to give money for research that's going to say, don't eat these products. Right. That's not going to happen. It just right. isn't going to happen. So yeah. really we want non-industry funded research so that there aren't the biases and then we can see what really happens. And what's so amazing in plant-based medicine is you have patients that have all of these risk factors for, uh, for chronic disease, obesity, elevated blood pressure, elevated cholesterol, um, uh, 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 a, a high fasting blood glucose. You look at all these things together, you get something called metabolic syndrome. When these patients go on a plant-based diet, many of these things resolve. 
many of these risk factors resolve. They have to decrease their medicine. So, you know, it's, it, it doesn't take a, a rocket scientist, you know, or the dean of a medical school to say, gee, you have a group of people, you do these things to them, and all these numbers drop. Whatever the reason is, they drop. So maybe this is a good thing to do. I agree. Can I just, I have to go in a couple minutes, but yeah, can I, we, what, we've talked about cancer organs. We've talked about heart saturated fat organs. Um, let me talk about the brain for a minute because this okay. is the last Friday in June of 2020. And June is not only Men's Health Month, it's also Alzheimer's Awareness Month. And not something that I necessarily dive deep in. I leave that to uh, Team Shurzai, who uh, I'm sure will end up on the show. They will but, be. More and more heart brain are showing a lot of consistent overlap in uh, both prevention, disease, uh, pathophysiology. So uh, this week, two studies were published. It's not all about science, but since they're published, they're so cool. One was published this week. It's about 2,800 people in Chicago. It's called Chicago Healthy Aging Society study, and then also Rush University. They lumped these together about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, they asked a group of people a thousand questions. And surprisingly, a fairly high number developed Alzheimer's in follow-up. What lifestyle factors were associated with less risk of Alzheimer's? And there were five, and they're gonna sound just like a lot of what we talked about today. 150 minutes a week of exercise, don't smoke, alcohol in moderation. They didn't say zero, but they said little, little or moderation was their words. Um, eat fruits and vegetables more than the average American. There's something called the MIND, the MIND diet. It's an extremely fruit, vegetable, legume, grain rich diet that is like the Mediterranean diet. And the fifth one was do brain games. Be interviewed by Lisa Carlin or play Sudoku or you know, uh, do puzzles and such. Those that did four or five of the five had 60% less risk of developing Alzheimer's. And again, think about that. You know, if you, if I had a grandfather die of Alzheimer's, it's horrible. 60% of people don't need to go down that path by five of five activities. Almost perfectly overlap with American Cancer Society, except for perhaps the brain game aspect of it. It could be dancing, singing, learning a new language, actually. And then there's a second study just to wrap up in Canada published this week, bigger, about 8,500 people. They used a test of verbal fluency. How fast can you talk appropriately? It's a test of brain health. And they, again, looked in this database of predictors of better than average brain performance. What do you think came out on top? The number of servings of fruits and vegetables a day you eat was the number one predictor of brain and verbal fluency and cognitive function. Six, six or more a day was their assessment. You wanna keep your brain young. You are not grilling beef. You are tossing salads and, you know, roasting portobellos and, you know, eating beets and grabbing apples and oranges. So big brain data that just confirms, again, that whole network thing, cancer, heart, brain, throw in other systems, joints, anything you want to throw in there. It's a plant friendly world, boys and girls. That's a good note. I'm glad you were able to end on a, on a positive note. So I want to thank you so much for joining me again. You are my returning guest. You'll be back again, I think, on August 7th. Yeah, we might and have a little bit of We might bring Christmas Carol with us, but I will not disclose that. <laughs> yeah, we'll be right to call her Christmas Carol now the more I think about it. <laughs> are we talking about Juliana? Who are we talking about? Helen. I wasn't going to say the name. Hanukkah Helen, maybe, yeah. Uh, Okay, well, we can do that. Let's put together a show and do that. Anyway, everybody, thank you so much for joining us today on Hey Doc, What's New in Plant-Based Medicine. Next week, we have Dr. Deborah Shapiro, who is a board-certified OBGYN, mm -hmm. and she is turned uh, health coach. So she gets to spend her time because when she was working in the hospital at Kaiser, you only have so much time to spend with each patient. If you want to talk about what they eat and do all these things, you can't do that and be employed because you get seven or nine minutes with each patient. So she is going to talk to us about becoming, she's still an OBGYN, but becoming a health coach. I think it's going to be a great show. So uh, join us next Friday, 10 a.m. And uh, thank you so much, Dr. Khan. Have a great weekend. Pleasure. And everybody blow kisses to Sparky.
Lisa's dog that needs a couple of prayers. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. you. Have a good day. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye everybody. Thank you.